Um, welcome everybody to our conversations uh, meeting today. We have a wonderful audience. I'm so glad to see all of you with us today, but we have a wonderful speaker. And I think that brought so many of you here. So it's an absolute pleasure for me uh, to in introduce our internet conversation speaker today, Dr. Natalie uh, Uomini. Uomini. And uh, Natalie and I first met, I should say, I was delighted to first meet Natalie at a Templeton Foundation a meeting um, many years, I guess it was about two years ago. And uh, I think we immediately bonded. I, I'm just been fascinated with her work. Natalie is a senior scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. She received her BA in Cognitive Science and Linguistics at the University of California in San Diego. She then received, did, her, did two master's degrees, one in linguistics and teaching French as a foreign language at the University of Grenoble. She did her second uh, MA in biological anthropology at Durham University, and then completed her PhD in, anth in evolutionary anthropology and archeology span at the University of Southampton in the UK. So with this very interdisciplinary and uh, unique combination of talents and expertise, Natalie now integrates and uses this interdisciplinary expertise to investigate the continuities in evolution, uh, in the evolution of cognition across species, including us human species. And she has a specific focus on tool use, intelligence, and communication. Natalie, we are so thrilled to have you with us here today and to hear about your research. And I'll just turn it right over to you. Oh, and by the way, Natalie has been working with us as a member of our ethics working group with the Interspecies Internet. So I just wanna say thank you, Natalie, for, for being such a great member of our, of our group too. You brought so much to the Interspecies Internet already. So I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Diana. I'll just uh, start my screen sharing here and uh, put it into presenter mode. So I hope that's uh, all right now. And I just need to hide the controls there. So I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, so thanks, Diana, for this wonderful introduction. I'm, my name is Natalie Wamini, and um, yeah, as Diana mentioned, we connected through the interspecies uh, internet. And um, so here I am. I'm really delighted actually to be here. Um, before I start my talk, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors who've um, supported the research that I'll be presenting today. So the Templeton World Charity Foundation, the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History, and the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology have been uh, supporting this work. And um, I myself, I'm really delighted to be here in front of all of you. It's a real pleasure to be with like-minded people who really believe in interspecies communication. And this is uh, gonna be the focus of my talk today, in particular uh, with crows. But I'd like to start just uh, with a brief background to myself. Um, I'm sitting actually at the intersection of multiple disciplines. And as Diana so kindly mentioned, I have a degrees in cognitive science, in linguistics, anthropology, and archeology. span And as a postdoc, I've been working in neuroscience and animal behavior. And the different research topics that I've been pursuing in my academic career have been um, at the intersections to where these disciplines meet. So for example, animal minds, language, animal communication, language evolution, um, cognitive evolution, origins of language and tool making. And the kind of line of research that I've been following for the last uh, 10 to 15 years is about uh, language and tools in particular as these were first thought to be uh, features that make humans special. And in fact, as we know, other animals also do make tools, possibly also have language. And um, my interest is in finding out what are the types of intelligence that underlie these linguistic and technological skills. And in fact, I think that we are actually not so special <laughs> as uh, we, we used to think. 
<clears throat> so in my talk today, uh, it's about conversations with crows. So first I'll briefly define what I mean by conversation in this talk. Um, and then I'll share with you what we know about New Caledonian crows and I'll share some of the research that I have been doing that's not yet published about their communication. And finally, I'd like to uh, give you some of my thoughts about interspecies communication, and what forms it could take, and what are the kinds of things that I think need to be in place before it can actually happen. So conversation is defined in the Cambridge English Dictionary is a talk between two or more people in which thoughts, feelings, and ideas are expressed, questions are asked and answered, or news and information is exchanged. Uh, I'll skip the question of whether uh, animals, non-human animals can be considered people. In this case, we're talking about individuals, um, but the point here is that it's about an exchange of thoughts, feelings, ideas, questions, news, or information. And so this is the core of sort of what kinds of things are being exchanged between two individuals. When, when we look at the kingdom of life, the animal kingdom, and even the plants, um, we could ask, well, you know, do these individuals exchange thoughts, feelings, ideas, questions, news, or information? And in fact, I think by all, all biologists would say that yes, uh, practically every life form on the planet does exchange at least one of these things. And so, in fact, you know, here we have conversations going on on planet Earth in many different forms around us. So this is really the uh, basic definition that I'm talking about today. So when you look at the sort of tree of life, we see the, you know, we hear humans, we are up here, uh, our species is about 10 million years old. The primate clade that we belong to is 74 million years old. And this uh, split here between the branch that led to humans and the branch that leads to, that led to reptiles and birds, is about 310 million years old. And when we go back up this um, sorops, uh, this um, reptiles branch, the bird clade is 150 million years old. And right at the top there, we have New Caledonian crows, and they're about 5 million years old. And in fact, New Caledonian crows and humans share some really interesting features. And this is quite remarkable because we consider that there's 310 million years of evolution. In fact, that's 600 million years of evolution um, in total that separates us. And so this is what makes New Caledonian crows a particularly interesting species to help us understand the different evolutionary um, features that could have led, you know, on these separate lines, could have led to shared traits today. So I'd like to introduce this wonderful and fascinating species to you. Uh, I've been very fortunate to do field work in New Caledonia with these birds. Uh, I think most of you in the audience live in a Western country, if I'm not mistaken. So you probably have seen crows in whether you're in North America or Europe. The crows that, that you know, that we know here in, in Europe or the Americas, are about twice the size of these, um, the ones that you're seeing in the picture here. So they are small sized uh, crow, but uh, they're very large brained. So they're quite uh, fascinating and they're mostly well known for their ability to make tools and use tools. They also learn. So if you look at the individual here in the middle, that's a juvenile. It has two parents. So the pink mouth is the juvenile, and it's just about to start using a tool that one of its parents has left. And they are very sort of a, very good social learners. They learn these tool making skills 
from the adults around them. And just like us, uh, they really need a lot of uh, parenting. They need extended parenting to learn these skills. So the species itself is, has particular features, as I mentioned, that are shared with humans. And Gavin Hunt and I, in our 2016 paper, we argued that they're actually very uh, similar in many ways. So they have a dedicated anatomy for tool use similar to us. They have a very special shape of their beak and they also have binocular vision. They also have the largest relative brain size of Corvid. That's the brain size compared to their body size. And humans also, we have the largest relative brain size in our clade. They do fi very fine manipulations with their bill or beak. And this is similar to the way we can use our hands to do very fine things. They also have strong laterality or beakedness, similar to our handedness. And they have these extended childhoods. They're cared for by their parents for two years or more, and this is quite unusual. They do use tools to hunt animal prey, just as our ancestors did. And they're vocal learners. So in fact, a lot has been already written about their tool making and tool usability but we really don't know much about their vocal ability. And um, what's uh, so strange about this? Well, vocal learning for, for a start is pretty unusual in the animal kingdom. There are a few species here and there who have this ability to really imitate uh, any kind of sound that they hear. And in fact, just like uh, humans, they really need to get the input. So they, they're not born with a repertoire of sounds, they have to get the input from the social group that they grow up with. The same way that humans need to be growing up uh, in a place to learn that language. So my focus today really in this conversations series is gonna be about a vocal communication. I'm not gonna talk at all about body language or visual communication. Although that is a complete uh, another uh, field that would be another talk. I'll give you an example here. So this is actually a crow that I met him. He grew up with a family. He was rescued as a baby from the nest. So he never got the input from wild crows. <laughs> and he imitates all kinds of sounds. He pretends to laugh. Yeah, it's funny. Isn't it funny how he doesn't open his mouth when he does that? So he barks he like, like a dog. Head. He makes car engine sounds. He imitates the man's voice. He imitates. <laughs> So it, it's sort of, you know, this, this crow, is, so it's a completely tame crow. It's living freely with a family. Um, and it's about 20 years old now. So it has been around humans for a long time. However, I stood in front of this crow and recorded its sounds. I did not feel like I was having a conversation with it. It was simply pouring out the sounds that it had learned to make. And so what I realized then was that to really understand how these crows communicate, I would need to study wild crows living in the forest in their natural groups, in their natural habitat. So that's just what I set out to do. So now when we work with human participants in, in a research, we do this IRB process we do informed consent. And this is basically a procedure to make sure that our participants are voluntarily taking part in our study to make sure they have the necessary information and uh, that they can understand the risks and that their key, the key point is they're free to choose whether or not to participate in our study. And um, I must say, you know, I, I'm not trained as a biologist, so I have not been 
taught the um, way that biologists do research. And so I'm coming at things kind of in my own, in my own way. And I really believe that when working with animals, non-human animals, I believe that we should apply the same standards of, of um, a respect as when we work with humans. And so I try to make informed consent with birds. So how is this actually possible? <laughs> well, here's what I do. So first of all, we measured the first time we arrived there, we measured the flight distance, minimum flight distance, which is a measure that uh, bird experts use. You, you sort of walk towards uh, the bird and then you see at which point they fly away. So, and then you measure that distance and you find out at what distance they feel comfortable with your presence. And so we measured this at about 25 meters. So uh, then we had a protocol in the field that we would always stay 30 meters away from the birds. We never approach them um, unless they willingly approach themselves. So here we just set up a, an apparatus, an experiment. And then we, I don't know if you can see at the far top right of this photo here, the researchers, we sit in chairs and uh, we watch. We watch and the birds are free flying. They roam around the forest. If they want to come to our experiment, they can. And the beauty of this setup is that we know that every single time a bird comes to our, our experiment, we know that they're always motivated. They're always coming because they want to come. And so, um, in fact, I've combined these field experiments with systematic observations of these wild birds. And this allows us to keep a rigorous control of variables and a high ecological validity. So I've set up cameras and microphones in the trees and we filmed and audio recorded um, these wild crows in their natural habitat. So it really is, in fact, um, the approach that I'm taking is a, is a complement to the data that's obtained with uh, different types of experiments. Some other um, researchers like to capture their study animals. Sometimes they handle them, um, do some manipulations or, or treat them with some treatments. And um, what I'm doing is, is a complement to that. So I'm really only focusing on the, the the free animal, I don't manipulate them, I don't touch them or approach them. And I gain the information, really valuable information about uh, really what they're doing in their uh, natural life and in their, in their um, uh, free habitat. So this is what field work looks like on a small South Pacific island. Uh, we've set up here, we have fixed cameras. So we have places where we sit and keep uh, cameras. And we also walk around the forest and try to follow the birds as much as possible, as well as setting up automatic cameras uh, on the ground and also in the trees. So I had the great pleasure of climbing some tall trees to set up uh, large audio recorders and video cameras. So what we could do with all this data then um, basically, we're still, we have so much data that our analyses are still ongoing, but we've already broken new ground here. And some of the main points are that I already have the largest collection of video and audio of New Caledonian crows. And I'm working now on how to make this accessible for open science because it's pretty unwieldy. Uh, we also have the first observations of some previously undocumented events in the species, such as hunting particular types of prey that haven't been seen before, um, territory defense, dealing with injuries and certain courtship behaviors. And uh, what I've, my colleagues and I published in our uh, 2020 paper was that this extended parenting period gives juveniles a safe haven uh, where they can practice the vital skills that both support and enable their large brains to grow. So this has to do with uh, tool making and tool use as well as communication. So um, we really wanna talk about communication here. So I've brought you some examples from our field work 
The first one here is an example of the sum of the soft calls they make. So uh, you might want to turn up the volume on your computer uh, just for this one. As you can see, they don't always open their beak fully, uh, so they can make a wide variety of sounds, even with the closed mouth. We also have uh, some calls that are quite loud. So if it's too loud, you might want to turn down the volume. I think we tested the volume. It should be OK. These are calls that they make, we think, to keep track of each other through the day. This last uh, sound that you saw at the very end here was begging. And in fact, that's what they do when they're asking for food. So this one, I think the other individual was uh, coming with some food. And um, so that's what was happening here. We also have very interesting call exchanges. So um, in terms of sort of conversational ability, we do see very often that they, especially in the evening, uh, before, as dusk is falling, they start to regroup. So they actually have like a fission fusion type of social system where they will gather briefly in groups and then they basically spend most of the day individually or in pairs. And they'll then in the evening gather again uh, before they roost together. And here we had a very interesting call exchange um, you'll see me pointing with my finger on the camera. The direction of the two individuals who are exchanging calls. Well, they're exchanging single calls here. And once we zoomed in on the individual on the right who was calling, we could see that they were basically picking up some last few bites to eat before bed. They exchange a few calls and then in the end they uh, just fast forward it because it's a bit jumpy. So in the end, after this uh, exchange of single calls, then the one individual flew and joined the other one. And this is what we see very often. So we do see these kinds of call exchanges during the day as well when they've split up. And then we see that they often um, start to exchange. And these exchanges always end with one of the individuals joining the other. So this makes us uh, quite um, fairly confident that these are contact calls, which are similar to the ones that are used by some kinds of primates and many other species. Uh, this final video clip here is an example of a family group. So the two on the left are juveniles and the two on the right are to adults, probably their parents. You can see the juvenile in the middle here begging quite a lot. The adults on the right are using tools to probe into this dead wood and get some beetle larvae. And the two juveniles, one of them is begging, the other is sort of probing with its beak, but not using a tool yet. You'll see the adult just extract one grub there at the moment. I think it's not going to feed it to the juvenile. So the juveniles do beg a lot, but they don't always get fed. So this is another point about the extended parenting that's so fascinating that although the, the parents really do tolerate these youngsters following them around and they don't always feed them. So these kinds of sort of uh, different 
uh, vocal calls that we observe, the first thing we did with our data was try and create a first taxonomy or classification of the different call types. So we define a call um, as the sound that the bird makes in one breath. And usually uh, if the call is, if the different you know, sounds are separated by a gap of more than one second, then we say it's a different type of a different call. And so we made here really a descriptive classification because we don't want to, or we cannot really impose meanings yet on these calls. So for the moment, we start with this simple classification by the number of syllables that's in one of the calls. So single, double, triple, quadruple, or five or more. And then there are these uh, begging sounds that they make when they want to be fed. They're quite distinctive. And there are a couple of other um, unusual and rare uh, sounds that we hear, which we haven't quite been able to classify too well. Uh, but what we sort of the different context or meanings that we can see in from these examples is, um, first of all, in an alarm situation, whether there's been um, a predator or a new person coming into the forest that's an unknown person or a predator. Um, these contact calls that I mentioned that they keep track of each other through the day when they're visually separated. They also have possibly a call that they use to identify a certain type of new food source. Now, often this is also called in a group when they gather together. And then the softer calls, uh, we're not quite sure uh, but they do seem to be not directed at other individuals and they're so soft that really they can't be heard very far away. So we think they might be something like comforting or something else. So this still remains to be seen. Um, but if you're interested to see some more examples of these calls, I've put a few videos on YouTube. You can search under Dr. Nat's research videos or just email me. I'll be glad to send you some links. The second thing we did with our data was to use machine learning to identify the individual crows. This work was done by my project collaborators, Patrick and Cassie of Indiana University. And what they did was really train uh, this computer to identify, first of all, crow sounds from all the background noise in the forest. And second, the second step is gonna be to identify individual crows basically using their voice signature, their individual voice signature, because we know uh, they most likely have, because other crow species do have individual, individually identifiable voices. Dolphins, for example. So there's a, it's very highly likely that these crows also use the voice to identify each other. So this is uh, ongoing work. We have so much, so much data that we're really, um, it's, it takes a long time to prepare it for machine learning. So that's where we are now, but the results have been pretty exciting so far. And that there are a few things that we do need uh, in order to really, really get a handle on what these crows are saying to each other because they are, they're moving around the forest all day long. As I mentioned, they, they tend to have efficient fusion social system. So they really, you know, are, they're moving between groups or they're moving around different locations on the forest. And in particular, it would be fantastic to be able to track them with GPS so that we can really see how the individuals are uh, interacting with different groups or different like subgroups, I suppose and uh, how they move around and how they use the space because it isn't clear yet uh, whether each family has its own small territory or whether they share because we do see, uh, for example, at different seasons, different size groups. So there's some really tantalizing glimpses here that we can't quite uh, figure out just from uh, the, the facilities that we have. So if we could 
really get GPS tags on every individual, then we'd have a really great uh, tracking ability to, to follow their movements. Secondly, we really do need some long-term following. So we need to really send researchers out, just like Jane Goodall, following these crows for months and months and months and years on end to be able to get to know the individuals. It's, and it, it's going to be really essential to learn in what situations the calls are used. So to start to understand the meanings of these different calls, we need to be able to document all the different contexts and situations. And some of the calls are so rare, we only have like two or three examples of them so far. So these ones, especially you would need more time to be able to collect more examples of those. And thirdly, we need more field sites because we know that there's cultural variation in the tools that these crows make and probably also in their uh, vocal communication. So we could probably talk about dialects and this would be really uh, fantastic if we could have researchers at different locations around the island of New Caledonia and comparing those different groups and different dialects. So those are some of the things uh, that, that will really help us to, to get to know, to be able to really listen in more on these conversations. So I wanna sort of spend the last few minutes here um, sharing some of my thoughts about interspecies communication. Um, it's, it's like, you know, what are the things that I think need to be in place if we want to achieve this? In fact, I think there are five uh, main prerequisites. So I think sort of, for example, the first sort of first prerequisite would be that two individuals of different species, they would have to have a shared understanding or at the very least a shared goal. And there needs to be something they're aiming for. And they need to have similar thought processes. So for example, if we talk about exchanging, you know, the original definition of a conversation, exchanging information or even emotions, well, those individuals would need to be aware of their own emotions in order to exchange them. So there needs to be something at least uh, similar, uh, similar goals or, or similar thought processes. Secondly, I think there needs to be a desire to communicate. So for example, they need to want to engage with that other individual or that other species. So think of a snail, for example, like if we could talk to a snail, really what would we want to say to it? What would the snail want to say to us? I mean, do we honestly really think there's anything we could talk talk to a snail about. So I think we have to really uh, consider then, you know, what would be the need for communication or what would they to get out of it? They also need to have compatible sensory systems. So when you think about all the different modes of communication by scent or by hearing, by vision, by chemical signals, there's all sorts on all sorts and they're not necessarily compatible. And this is key for both the outgoing message and the incoming message. We need to be able to produce signals that the other can perceive and we have to be able to perceive those signals. So a squid and a bee, I mean, they would, they would really struggle to find some common ground in terms of their sensory systems here. Fourth, uh, I think, you know, when we think about conversation, there has to be turn taking. So there has to be active listening, I think, and active signaling. It cannot work if the two individuals are talking over each other. So this is not just mutual eavesdropping, for example. I think there has to be really uh, um, an active ability to both listen and signal to the other. 
And the fifth uh, point I think is that the individuals need to have matching a type of intelligence. So for example, uh, wolves and orangutans, they both have a very high social intelligence. So this could give them a, a level on which to start to communicate. But I think these, these five points are probably, I'm sure not the only ones, but I, to me, these are sort of the, the core ones. And when we think about what already exists in the world, I mean, there are examples of interspecies communication. The honey guide is one of the fascinating ones birds are helping humans how to find beehives. And this is known from Mozambique, Tanzania, Kenya, and several other African countries. And these bird and human, they exchange sounds and whistles and they monitor each other's movements towards the beehive. So the bird leads the human to the beehive, the human chops down the tree, gets the beehive, and they leave some wax for the birds, which the birds really love. So here they have a shared goal. The shared goal is to get honey or to find the beehive. They have a, a sensory system, the, the sense of hearing that they can use to create a signals and perceive each other's signals. And they have a, a, a reason to communicate. And there are other examples. There were dolphins and fishermen in Brazil who help each other to find fish in the ocean. So there's there are a few, a few of these examples out there. But I wanted to do a thought experiment and really go into what kind of conversation would you have with a new Caledonian crow based on what we know of their behavior in the wild? Well, we could, for example, they could request food from us. They already do that with each other. They beg to each other. And in fact, I had one experience uh, in my last field season where one of the juveniles came to me and begged at me just as I was refilling the, um, the meat that we give them. And so I think they can, they can see us as a food provider. We could also imagine that we could show them a food source. Perhaps we could signal to them that we're bringing food in some way. I think they would, they would uh, you know, have a, this shared goal of obtaining food. Um, we could perhaps also share each other's location. So this seems to be something they do uh, with, with themselves, with each other through the day, keeping track and asking each other where they're located. Identification could also be another point. And in fact, we, we guess that they can identify each other because they do often send calls in a certain direction when they have heard a certain individual calling, they'll orient their body and call back in that direction, even though there might be other individuals in another direction. So it could be useful also for us to identify ourselves as friends and so they can keep track of who's, who's there and to not know who, who's, who's dangerous or who might be a friend. And perhaps also we could warn them of danger. So they do have their own warning signs. They have seven different birds of prey on New Caledonia and they do signal uh, with certain calls when those are seen. Um, but I don't know if we could actually help them with that. It might be difficult to get them to understand it, but perhaps we could really uh, try some playback experiments where we play those uh, different warning signals and see if they behave appropriately. So those are sort of the, these are the all the points I could come up with in my thought experiment about what could a conversation with a crow uh, look like. And it seems like the, the sort of points are quite limited. So when we think about what they communicate to each other this is only what we know, right? They might be communicating all sorts of other things that we haven't got yet. So this is also why we need more research. But in fact, the points that we as humans might have in common with them seem to be uh, rather limited, but still tractable. So I still think this, this is tractable. 
So to sum up here, um, this final slide here is a sort of my conclusion. So I think First of all, we have to recognize that interspecies communication already exists. It is rare in time and space, but there are cases, active cases, and I think we really need to study them well to understand exactly what makes them successful and or what makes them disappear. New Caledonian crows, I think, are excellent candidates due to those many shared traits they have with humans, such as vocal learning, and technical intelligence. I think these shared traits give us many uh, points of contact where we could potentially um, have a shared goals or shared um, signals. But we do need much more targeted research on this species in particular in their communication, not only vocal communication, but also uh, physical, visual and bodily communication. For example, they also um, can raise their feathers in certain ways. And we know that uh, ravens, American ravens, they use uh, lifting of feathers in different body parts as types of signals. So there's potentially a huge range of, of different signals they can produce with sound and vision, and vision. But I think the main sort of core here is that we need to carefully consider the prerequisites to help us really focus our efforts on the most likely species for interspecies communication. So that we really need to uh, not just try to create something that's universal, but rather to focus there on the, the pairs of species that will be most likely to have those shared goals and shared sensory systems. So that I think is going to be the way forward for interspecies communication. So thanks again and thank you all for your interest. Thank you so much Natalie for such a wonderful talk. Um, so I think we should open the floor right now for questions and I'm, uh, I'm Again, there was a lot to digest there, and I th we've had a few questions early on. Let me, um, I'll just read off, let me just get to the list. I'll unshare my screen now. I think Vince has a question, Diana. Yes, uh, I, well, okay, I was just looking earlier, but Vint, go ahead. Floor is well, yours. Uh, you should feel free to prosecute a lot of the questions that popped up. Uh, this is a fascinating talk, and so thank you for taking the time to share all this with us. Uh, I never did know anything about Caledonian crows, although we have some big fat crows here that uh, appear to be absolutely fearless. Uh, you know, they 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 basically uh, are fighting with the squirrels over the food that we uh, we leave for uh, both of them. So one question is whether you've observed uh, cooperation between uh, the crows? And if so, what kind of cooperation have you encountered? What were they trying to accomplish? And was there any audible uh, indication of what was going on? Yes, it's a great question. We did see some cases of territory defense where it seemed like this uh, one couple who was starting to uh, create their nest, to build their nesting site, and then proceeded to chase out all the crows who entered their small uh, patch of wood. So they do uh, fly, they chase, um, lots of calling in all directions. So that'll take us a little bit of decoding to really, uh, once we have the machine learning set up to identify the individuals in all those overlapping calls, we'll be able to um, start to decode that. Uh, but they do certainly cooperate also in um, nesting, they cooperate in hunting. We've seen them hunting a, um, um, a small uh, rat together and uh, other types of, yeah, especially in interacting against uh, other groups. So, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Diana, just one oh, other thing. No, go ahead, ben. I just want to emphasize for everybody else on the call that one of the most valuable things that Natalie uh, has uh, offered in this presentation is information about stuff she wishes she could do if she had the right equipment because people like Neil Gershenfeld and, and, uh, and I are uh, not biologists or anything, but we like to build stuff. 
And so if we could figure out how to be helpful, that's you know, something we would enjoy. And so all, for all of you, if you're thinking about infrastructure, measurement, observation, uh, data capture, those are things that help us a lot in thinking about what we could do uh, as part of the interspecies internet effort. Yeah, okay. we, Vin, thank you for bringing that up because that's so critical. I mean, that's one of the goals is to bring this forum together and really come up with help and finding ways to go to these next steps. So again, we sort of welcome others to join in on that as well. Thanks. You have ideas. I think it's a it's a valuable conversation to have because we as scientists don't necessarily know what what's out there or what's even possible. So that's why it's really useful to be, just talk to you guys to to even know what what you can do and what can be done. What, um, uh, there's, there were some early questions and then I'm looking, taking uh, notes of hands that are up. I'm trying okay. to get everything. Well, I, I'm working my way through the chat. I think the first question here was about the, the one of the videos I showed with, did the adult just poke the juvenile to get its attention? Well, it was a very funny uh, situation. I don't actually know why it was poking, uh, <laughs> but it was, yeah, I've never seen that before actually. So <laughs> that's the, um, yes. Uh, unknown, unknown reason. Um, but yeah, possibly it was just teasing. Who knows? Do they have a sense of humor? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> um, Thomas Green had a really early question. Um, he was, Thomas, do you want to come on and ask it yourself? Or do you want me to say it? Thomas, are you there? You want to unmute? Well, I'll ask the question for you then. It says, is there much data for the crows that the crows map the volume and shape of the sounds with their relative locations uh, of the con conver conversational crows, the conversant crows. Yeah, I think we, so we can do, we have uh, with our audio recorders, we actually can triangulate. So we set up six different audio recorders that are synchronized and we're, we'll, we are able to pinpoint their location based on how the, you know, the volume at which the calls reaches each of the recorders. So we'll be also working on that to track them, some of the movements of those crows. That's a great question. Thanks. Um, Khan, you had a, you have your hand up. Yes, could you comment on the relative proportion of visual signals versus acoustic signals? And does it look like they're redundant in terms of having the same message or are there different messages carried on visual channels versus acoustic channels? Yeah, I'd really love to be able to answer this question, but that's one of the things that's gonna need a whole nother grant. So we really don't know anything about their visual communication. We do know uh, a lot about American ravens and American crows, but New Caledonian crows, no one's ever studied their <laughs> visual communication. and there's only been one study on their vocal communication so far. So we, yes, I think that would be one of the first questions, whether there is redundancy, we don't know. And this, so far we have not had enough data simply to be able to start to even look at their visual signals. Um, thank you. Uh, Claire Hughes, Claire, you had your hand up. I think Claire? Mason had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I meant to I simply think Claire send a pause. Actually, oh, sorry. Yeah. Claire, I think you had your hand up next, and then Mason. I meant to simply send a pause. Oh, sorry I'm sorry. That. Okay. You. Ma sorry, Mason, you had a question. I'm, I'm fascinated by so much of this. Um, let me just pick on one point in particular I think is kind of interesting, is the way that the, the long juvenile period, so the parents are, well, the children are learning from the parents. I'm wanting to figure out, are the parents trying to teach the children? Or are their parents just doing stuff that the children imitate? Um, so, I mean, this seems to be one of the interesting facets of the people used to separate out human communication from many other animal forms of communication. Um, experiments with the puzzle boxes, for example. We have an opaque puzzle box, turn here, twist here, tap here, get a treat out. They show that to the chimpanzees and the chimpanzees will imitate. You make the box transparent and the chimpanzees will realize two of those steps are redundant. Just go for the tap here, it'll get the treat out. Human, chim human children keep doing the unnecessary steps even when the box is transparent because there's somehow the trust that the adults are teaching me something it's important for me to learn. Yes. That sort of trust, shared goals, actively trying to teach the children is supposedly the thing that 
distinguishes humans from other animals. And it always struck me that a long juvenile period studying parents teaching children as opposed to interspecies imitating twisting boxes and so on would be a really interesting place to look at. You got a lot of data here. I'm, I'm wondering if you've seen or have any data that might indicate parents actively trying to teach the children. I noticed one point in the um, chat, somebody asked about cooperative work, which seems to be the sort of, I'm trying to get you to learn this, listen up, idiot child, come pay attention over here, kind of gestures and things by the adults sort of trying to get the kids to work, like prodding the kid, pay attention here, that might've been happening in one of those videos. Do you see much evidence of that sort of actively yes. trying to teach? Thank you for thank you for this uh, question, because actually the, the um, the research that I so the the funded project that I've just finished uh, collecting data for was about teaching, so it was not primarily about communication. So the, the whole the, so my whole aim was here looking at how the interaction between adults and juveniles around these skills, and in fact we do find that there are certain um, uh, aspects that we could call teaching. So the adults, for example, they're very tolerant. To the juveniles the juveniles are often like put their face right in to the adults face sometimes the head is touching they'll be really right there in their face and the adults are super tolerant and they seem to be really uh, allowing these juveniles to to um actively uh, promote their own learning they also do for example leaving their tools as i showed in one of the video we don't know if that's intentional or accidental, but in any case, they do it frequently. And uh, sometimes, especially when the juveniles are nearby. And then there are also some uh, examples where we've really seen the, the juvenile uh, start to make a tool and then the adult will take the tool, do something to it and then give it back. So in fact, the, there's some, really we have a few because we haven't been able to spend a long time in the field with the um, projects we've done, but it's been, I think, a total six, about six months over three field trips. And we have seen few tantalizing cases of these, uh, what you might call teaching events, but it, it's really fascinating. And I think with more field work and more time, we could certainly uh, get a good handle on that. But I think, it, you know, in terms of the ability to teach, I think it the potential could be there because they certainly uh, they do have super large brains for their body size, so they are potentially one of the most intelligent corvid species. And I think they have this high social tolerance, which really gives them uh, um, motivation, really, to you know, to, to support the juveniles in their learning process. And just as a very quick follow-up, I'd love to figure out a way to do some interspecies teaching. Look, I can show you how to get some food if you just make a tool like this. Um, and refine a tool together or something like that. It seems the opportunities for interspecies communication around I'm yeah. trying to trying to learn from or teach uh, a different species how to get some food they don't currently know how to access. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Jonas, I think you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, Natalie, thank you very much for your presentation. And I uh, have a quick question, maybe quick, we'll see <clears throat> shortly. How is your approach to decoding uh, in sense of meaning? So you want to know what the calls mean. And uh, um, to explain further, I saw you had a connection to, uh, to Leipzig, um, to Max Planck Institute, where Tomasello, Marco Tomasello did a lot uh, of research. And I'm asking because um, you as an interpreter of the calls um, need to have a common understanding to decode um, what the calls could probably mean. And this is why I'm, uh, I'm asking from a Michael Tomasello perspective, kind of common ground thing. How was your approach to decoding? Thanks for this question. No, it's one of the cores of, you know, what has to be done, I think, to start to decode those signals. So uh, what the primatologists have been doing has been quite effective, I think. So they really, it's all about data. So they just collect a lot of uh, video examples of calling and situations. And then you purely by the um, correlation by the, so when there's a call that happens in a certain situation, you can then correlate uh, you know, start to correlate those together. So it really, it depends on 
having enough data to be able to start to see the patterns in the data. So it really is that that's the one, that's the first step. And the second step is then you start to build a hypothesis of, okay, this call is only given in this situation. So we think it might mean this. And then you, you do playback experiments. So that's the second step where you do these really careful playback experiments where you try not to um, scare them or you know you try not to traumatize them, but you do some very clever, you have to cleverly design the playback experiments that you really then see their reaction and see if the reaction is what you've expected. And uh, so it, it is a multi-stage, but the first step really is just collecting enough data to start to even gather the samples of the different calls that you find. You know, if, I think, uh, go ahead, sorry. Jonas. No, you go yeah. down. <laughs> if I might have a follow-up on this one. Um, because um, statistics aside, um, but don't you have a kind of intuition about uh, about meanings because you you've spent quite a time uh, with those uh, with that species? Yes, absolutely. I think anybody who spends time with any animal really gets to know gets an intuition of of this call. So of course that's the first thing that we sort of this is um, the first thing that we notice. But then we need to scientifically validate it with these um, cases and patterns. So yes, there's certainly, I think, for example, that uh, we do start to recognize the individuals, for example, but we don't really need to prove it by some acoustic analyses. And so the, the most beautiful outcome would be if we can show that the intuitions that we have are really validated um, through the statistics. Okay. Thank you very much. One last thing, um, what what would be your uh, what would be your anticipation of this? Do you think your intuition might have uh, like ninety percent chance of uh, of getting validated by the statistical data, or eighty percent? What do you think? I'd, I'd say 50 percent because I think really our intuitions are it's like in a sense are based on our own mental statistics, right? But then in, on the other hand, we also have a lot of um, preconceptions, biases that we bring to it. So this is why we have to be a little careful. Like I wouldn't trust just an intuition. So I would really want to test it, give it a hard test uh, with those uh, approaches. So I think I would really say there have been some times in examples from other species where people's intuition were shown to be wrong. So it's really, um, yeah, I would give it 50%. Thank you very much. Thanks for those great questions, Jonas. Um, a few people have asked, and Natalie, you referred to before that uh, in terms of open science, you have a database that's shareable. Um, the, again, one of the people is asking, is there a link to a database that can be yeah. accessed? At the moment, no, it's uh, it's just hard drives right now. And so the next step needs to be first cleaning uh, those files to remove um, like any human <laughs> videos and audio <laughs> clips that might be inside. And then um, the next step is to find a way to put them online somehow publicly. So at the moment I haven't found a solution yet, uh, but it's gonna take a lot of pre-processing before they can be ready to go online. Well, Natalie, this is something that interspecies internet can perhaps help with. Vin, you know, Vin and Neil can attest to this. I don't know if Peter's here, but we um, we recently um, helped support getting Roger Payne's humpback whale data digitized. Some of it had been digitized earlier. We helped get it with a grant. Um, with the, also with the German Color Foundation to get the rest of that digitized. And now we're going to be hosting that. So on through um, Mark Graham's efforts with the Wayback Machine. So we should open up that conversation. So perhaps we can help with some of this as well, getting it. Fantastic. Up, uh, yeah. up, at least, not, I'm not saying we'll, we would digitize, you probably have it digitized, but for storage. Vin, yes. you know, I mean, do you, I think that's doable for us too, right? It would be good. Originally, I started uploading them onto the Max Planck um, servers and I, those, I can provide a public link, but the thing is those are, that I, I maxed out the the limits on those very quickly. So um, it's just, a, I think it's, yeah, right now it's the size uh, that's 
too high for <laughs> what we have available. I think we might be able to help with that. And again, we'll follow up. Uh, easy, we'll follow up after this. Thank you. Yeah, and I think one of the other things I just want to mention is that so many of us sort of share that goal of having, we have these large databases, we have them with dolphins, others have them with birds. And I think we can really start sharing, you know, and getting into conversations about the things that we have in common and try to help, you know, find solutions that we can all benefit from. I think that's one of the spirits um, of the interspecies internet is to bring forums of people together who have shared problems, shared goals, and try to find mutual solutions. So absolutely. Uh, this is a perfect example of how we can help move forward. Um, I'm looking for some other questions. Does anybody have any question, other questions they might? I have a few, but I'm deferring to other people. Um, I'm looking, trying to look through the chat here. I, um, there are a lot of wonderful comments about yes. the great talk. I'm looking for questions. Nat yeah. Holden has just put one in the chat, wondering what local knowledge or stories exist about these crows. Yeah, oh, thanks for this question. Well, yeah, that, that's exactly my next research um, field trip. So actually, the, the pandemic has really um, blocked everything. But as soon as New Caledonia reopens, I have a field assistant who's going to go and document the, the local legends about crows. And I've actually had some initial talks with uh, some local uh, tribal people. And they, they have a rich, rich um, stories about crows, they have mythology. For example, the crows are taboo. So it's really interesting that traditional, the indigenous people of New Caledonia do hunt a lot of native wildlife, but they really don't touch the crows. And they also consider the crows to be messengers. Some people say they can even understand what the crows are saying. And um, especially they would, for example, not touch the remains of crows. So there seems to be a special place for the crow. And, and I don't know if that's because they've been um, perhaps co co cooperating through their time. So the, the crows have been on New Caledonia for probably million a million years, maybe, we don't quite know, but humans have only been there for 3000 years. So in fact, the humans are newcomers. So it is possible that as soon as they arrived, they came to some cooperation or interactions with the crows. And so they, they anyway, certainly have a, a very rich um, le legend and lore about crows that would be worth um, understanding more. So I'm actually making um, very careful, a very respectful survey because the, the people there are quite concerned about <laughs> Western anthropologists who just come and take information and never give anything back. So what, what, we're be, what I've been doing in my uh, work is uh, organizing um, collaborative uh, work with the local people. So I'm really looking forward to uh, pursuing that further. Natalie, I had a question for you. I was really, um, I was really interested in what you were talking, what you showed about that young crow that didn't have input from conspecifics that started showing, a was imitating a variety of sounds from other animals. And it, it, it was reminiscent of things that have been reported with lots of species, with other vocal learners. Um, uh, Sam Ridgeway and his colleagues talked about a beluga whale, Nock, who was a, a juvenile, not with other beluga whales imitating human speech. Uh, we know harbor seals, uh, there's the famous Hoover who was housed outside of the New England Aquarium. Again, harbor seals, we believe, are also vocal learners um, and would imitate what sounded like inebriated old guys who are hanging out around him going, ha, 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 what are you doing? What are you doing? I mean, remarkable imitation of their social partners. Um, we certainly know the dolphins uh, you know, other cetaceans uh, like beluga whales, many of the cetaceans are vocal learners and they've imitated sounds of jackhammers when, you know, in their environment. It, it seems that what's compelling in terms of interspecies communication is that these young animals, when their vocalizations are somewhat malleable, particularly when they don't have input from conspecifics, are seem to be acoustically and socially aware in, at some levels. And I think that social awareness is quite in, important for any kind of interspecies communication, that they're aware of other sounds of others, but there's this 
there's there's this somehow drive or motivation to engage at least vocally and maybe that's an important part for us to all think about you know is getting into and it's the heart of it. it's how you began your talk talking about the fact that if we're getting into communication and interspecies communication it's a matter of sharing information with others that we're aware of and again if we define communication it's social process of you know sharing information um, so my question would be, if you could imagine creating an interface that you could take into the field so that they had control, like, because it's so beautiful the way you're giving these animals choice and control, you don't have the IR, but, you know, you don't have the consignment form, but you found a lovely way to work with them and say, it's your choice if you want to do this and show us. Um, what kind of interface could you imagine if someone was going to give you the opportunity to say, oh, we'll write you a check, design this system? Yeah, that's, oh, <laughs> thanks for your question. I mean, I think that, no, your point about the social awareness and it is a really important one because, of course, yeah, the, some of the examples we see on YouTube of raven talking ravens, for example, they do have this bond with their owner. So it is most certainly about uh, the who you're interacting with has to have a, a big part to play um, in terms of an interactive device. I mean, I could see some kind of push button system, you know, keypad, keyboard thing. Um, those are working well for dolphins and <laughs> they're working well for horses and dogs and all sorts. So I think, you know, it's something that the bird could peck on with its beak. I'm sure they could visually recognize symbols. I mean, we know from Irene Pepperberg's work that they have visual, birds in general have very good visual acuity. So I'm sure that they can really see, you could design little, you know, buttons that look different. I think that would be no problem. Um, and I, But it, they would really need to be linked to some outcome that the bird is interested in. So at the moment, the only thing we have found in our interactions is that we can provide food. <laughs> That's how they see us at the moment. Um, and I don't know what else we could be to them. Uh, so th th I think that remains to be seen. Yeah, have you, have, and have you, the other question, if I've, if I've, I don't wanna monopolize this, but I, I'm so fascinated by this. Um, if anybody else has hands up, I'm not seeing it. Have you, um, have, have you provided um, other kinds of like unusual items to look at their reaction to novelty? Yes. Are they neo, could you talk about neophobia versus, yeah. you know, what, what do you see with that? I was just curious. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's very interesting. So we did try to weigh them in the field because the they do have a sexual dimorphism. The males tend to be larger than females. So <clears throat> we also put a scale, a digital scale down uh, to try to get them, we put food on top. Now it was really interesting. It took them about a week before they actually got on that scale. So they were very somehow neophobic about that. But the strange thing is that we are cameras. We have small automatic cameras all over and right up by the, the feeding logs and they will approach them no problem. Mm. They really seem to be, um, they have a very selective um, fear somehow. We're not sure if it's that the scale is larger than the bird, whereas the small cameras are perhaps not as big as the bird. Perhaps they, it's just about the size. It might've been the coloration or the shininess, something like that. And um, so we also tried a mirror test. Uh, we set up a mirror and, and we had to actually stop this uh, after a few hours because the bird just freaked out completely freaked out and started attacking it and wouldn't stop. So we uh, could see that this was causing too much distress. So we immediately removed it. Um, but they, I think the, I have read meanwhile, some other papers where they said that if the mirror is like small, very small, much smaller than the actual animal that perhaps they can get used to it. Because I do believe that they would, I think they could recognize themselves there's no reason not to but I think it's just a matter of how the mirror is presented so I think uh, perhaps yes yeah, some, some more work on there carefully designing those experiments uh, without causing too much distress yeah I just wonder how long were they exposed to the mirror 
Well, we left we left it up, but I mean, we had a we were observing the whole time, so we actually we we decided to stop after a few hours because mm -hmm. literally the bird was just attacking it for like three hours solid, and we thought oh. if this continues, he's not going to get any food today. <laughs> so uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, but they you. did, you know, eventually with the scale that they were initially afraid of, they eventually got used to that. Mm -hmm. So they, there was really like the, the, the reaction to the scale was not at all of attack. They just simply they got really long sticks and tried to poke it. And they so they, it seemed more like curiosity. And we do know that they, they do use tools also to prod at unknown things like spiders. So uh, they, they have this they do have curiosity, but they also seem to be able to um, recognize uh, harmless objects like static cameras. I think we have, thank you, um, Natalie, that we have one more uh, time for one more question. Uh, Jonas, you had one, one related to what Nat uh, Natalie was just talking about. You want to pose it or do you want me to read it? Uh, excuse me, I don't know what you're, what you're pointing I'm at. I'm looking at, Jonas, you have a question, you made a suggestion like an, maybe doing an acoustic mirror Ah. their own calls back to them yeah that would Here be good go. yeah thanks it would be a good thing to try so with those playback experiments for sure uh yeah we'd have to think about uh, carefully playing the individual who's not present at the time so that also you also need to have good tracking uh, for that so once we get some gps trackers on the birds we'll be able to really play with some some very clever playback experiments well, I think we're going to end this day now. I think this has been a wonderful uh, Q&A session. Natalie, thank you for such a fascinating talk. Um, it's just been a, a wonderful having you here to share all this wonderful information with us. I think we thank all look so forward much. to hearing more. From, it's from been you. a real pleasure. Thanks for all. I've, I've saved the chat and I'll, I'll be able to read it um, once I log off. But it's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us today. Natalie, thanks again so much. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Have a good one. Take care, everybody.